Now that we understand how the synapse at the neuromuscular junction functions, let's see what experiments helped pave the way for this model. One pioneering experiment that helped establish many properties of the neuromuscular junction came from recordings made by Bernard Katz. To perform the recordings, Katz and his colleagues stimulated the axon motor neuron with an electrode and measured the membrane potential of the muscle fiber with another electrode. What this experiment essentially seeks to understand is how the muscle fiber reacts when an action potential is fired in the presynaptic motor neuron. If we do this experiment under physiological conditions and we keep track of the membrane potential as a function of time, the action potential generated in the motor neuron will produce an action potential in the muscle fiber after a small delay. Based on the chemical transmission system that we've just described, this response from the muscle fiber makes sense because we expect muscles to efficiently respond and contract in response to messages coming from motor neurons. This recording, however, hides the actual depolarization from the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors that took place to generate the action potential. The actual depolarization through the receptors looks something like this. As you can see, this red shaded curve, called the excitatory postsynaptic potential, is above the threshold and that's why it generates an action potential. But this is not something that we can technically see because the recordings would just show the curve for the action potential. Because this event occurs at the end plate potential, the specific excitatory postsynaptic potential is also referred to as an end plate potential, which is the terminology I will use to describe EPSPs at the neuromuscular junction. To isolate the end plate potential, one can apply the drug curare in the system. Obviously, in real life, the neuron would not stand up straight like this, but you have to imagine that the experimental setup has this curare influence on the muscle fiber. Recall that curare is an antagonist and prevents the opening of acetylcholine receptors. Consequently, in this system, when an action potential is sent to the muscle fiber, the end plate potential is reduced below threshold and does not generate any action potentials in the muscle fiber. The end plate potential then decays with time. The scientists behind the experiment now had a direct measure of the receptor's influence on the membrane potential. But going back to the physiological state, a very interesting result from these recordings that Katz noticed was the occurrence of small end plate potentials that happen spontaneously without any presynaptic stimulation. These random depolarizations were accordingly labeled miniature end plate potentials or simply MEPs. You will notice that these miniature end plate potentials are very similar in shape to the actual end plate potentials we get from stimulating the motor neuron. To manually get these maps from motor neuron stimulation, Katz and his colleagues used another technique to reduce the size of the end plate potential to try and match the size of the miniature end plate potentials. Their technique essentially consisted in baiting the postsynaptic muscle fiber in a solution of low calcium and high magnesium concentration. When the motor neuron is fired under these conditions, the magnitude of the EPP is reduced drastically and approaches the size of the MEP. What Katz and his team realized is that the smallest magnitude of the EPP that was not zero was identical in shape to the MEPs. The fact that the smallest possible end plate potential was the size of the miniature end plate potential hinted at the fact that MEPs might represent a quantum. In the words of Katz, the hypothesis behind these results is that EPPs are made out of unitary spontaneous MEPs. To support this quantal hypothesis, the scientists performing these experiments assumed that the phenomenon behind miniature end plate potentials were random and thus they tried to find a probabilistic relation that would fit their experimental data. When we consider multiple trials with this setup, you will notice that sometimes the end plate potential is larger than the miniature end plate potential here in trial 3 and that sometimes the end plate potential doesn't happen like in trial 4. Such cases are referred to as failures. But this is just 4 trials. There is no obvious relation to take away from here. In the paper from Boyd and Martin, the two scientists illustrate what happens if for many many more trials, about 200 more, you plot how many times you see a given amplitude. To make it more clear, let me remake their histogram. On the histogram, you will first notice in the right corner a distribution for the amplitudes of the miniature end plate potential, and as you can see, the most common amplitude associated to it is 0.4 millivolts. 
Obviously, because of experimental error, not all the recordings gave 0.4 millivolts, so there is a range of values between 0.2 and 0.5, but nonetheless, this is still a very small gap and thus makes the amplitude of MEPS pretty consistent. For these results, we can thus associate a Gaussian curve with a mean amplitude mu and variance sigma squared. Now, to get acquainted with the bigger histogram, let's see how the four trials we have fit in the graph. In the first trial, we have a single EPP that has the exact same magnitude as the MEP. If we assume our MEP has a magnitude of 0.4 millivolts, then our first recording would go in this column. In our second trial, we have an EPP that is about twice the size of the MEP and thus goes in this column. In the third experiment, the EPP is a bit bigger than the MEP, but not twice as big, and thus would go in between 0.4 and 0.8 millivolts. Finally, our fourth trial is a failure and goes in the failure column at 0 millivolts. Even though this experimental data already hints at the fact that the EPP is made out of multiple MEPs, or to be more precise according to this data, the magnitude of the EPP would be a multiple of 0.4 millivolts, we still need a more precise analysis to better support the hypothesis. This analysis is based on a statistical theory derived by Katz and his team. In this model, the letter N represents the number of quantal units that are released and P the probability that it is released. The letter M represents the quantal content and it is given by the average EPP size divided by the size of the MEP. For this statistical model, we will assume that the probability to release a quantal unit is small and constant. Also, we will assume that each release occurs independently. To model the theoretical distribution of expected observations, we can use the mean and the variance of the MEP distribution to separate the histogram in different groups. The first group corresponds to the mean and the variance, the second group corresponds to twice the mean and twice the variance, and the subsequent groups follow this trend. For each group, we can model a theoretical curve using the Poisson distribution, which is often used to model the occurrence of successes in a large number of trials. The Poisson distribution is given by this equation, and to find the theoretical distribution, we can multiply it by n, which represents the total number of observations. x is the number associated with the group and m is the quantal content. For each group, we can get a theoretical curve that illustrates the theoretical amount of observations that should be seen. When we add all the curves together, we get a continuous distribution that closely resembles the experimental data. The sum theoretical distribution also gives an estimation of failures which closely matches the experimental data. To summarize everything that we've covered here, the main takeaway is that this theoretical fitting further supports the idea that miniature n-plate potentials are the units of n-plate potentials. With the discovery of the quantal release, one important question that we need to uncover before we discuss what the quanta are is what exactly triggers the release of these quanta. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in our next discussion.